Hello. There you go. Welcome. So glad you're here on a Wednesday night. And, uh, man, it's, I was just telling them in the back, God, I feel like I haven't been here on a Wednesday night forever. But uh, I love Wednesday nights. And uh, what a great opportunity to come and get a midweek feel, right, and get your, get, your, get, your, get your fuel on and get the rest of the week going. And uh, it's really good. And so we're excited. Um, and uh, just want to really quick remind you that uh, this coming Sunday, we start a brand new series. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it is, it, this series is going to be life-changing. And we, um, you know, as we were just prepping through it um, and going through it. And then uh, this past uh, week, we met with the whole creative team. And they just really took it to a whole new level. And I'm telling you, you're going to be blessed this series. It's really going to challenge you um, in an area. You know, and things that I'm learning, and I'm, I've learned, you know, we've always talked about living a life that's extraordinary, that God wants you to have this extraordinary life, and kind of learn that, you know, you have to become unordinary before you can become extraordinary. And uh, it, it's going to be awesome. You're going to love it, and we're going to go through some characters. It's going to be good. But I got something for you today that I really believe is going to give you a good tool. So you ready to get in the Word today? Yeah. Come on, can you stand and give our online audience a big, big, big round of applause right now? God bless you. We love you. And, um, you know, one of the things that I hope that uh, at those of you watching online and, and, um, and you here today is, you know, if there's anything you live for, you're always going, how would I want to be remembered? And one of the things that I always say that how I would love to be remembered um, is never that we built a, an influential church or great businesses around. I hope one day I'm remembered as when people talk about Obed Martinez, they say, that man prays. He's a man of prayer. Better, he's a better prayer. He's better at prayer than he is preaching. And, um, and, and, I, and I tell you, um, I'm going to show you some secrets today that um, is going to get you from where you are to where God wants your life to be. Um, it's going to be challenging, but it's going to be good. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, we know this. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, put on. Anything that you can put on, you can take it off. And so, so at the end of the day, the devil wants you to take it off. But I'm going to teach you why it's important for you that every morning you put this on. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And, and, and if you don't know it now, I hope you know it by the time you leave. And that, that word scheme actually means the devil's strategy. That he has a strategic plan. Now here's what you have to understand. And that is that... The devil can't kill you. The devil can't touch you. But how he defeats you is he distracts you. I want to talk about that. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Why do you think Paul uses the word ground? Because the fight is not about possessions. The fight is about territory. And so at the end of the day, it's no good to have possessions if you don't own the territory. So the fight is about the territory, and then the possessions come. You're praying for possessions, and God wants you to take land. It's after you've done everything to what? Stand. Like he didn't say to fight. He just said stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It goes on. And it says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And he says this. Watch this. Watch this. He ain't no good just putting it on. He says, and what? Pray. 
Come on, say it again. Pray in the Spirit. In other words, this is a language, and if, and if you don't know what that is, you can go online. I've done a whole teaching on speaking in tongues, and it's not, it's not something weird, okay? It is an angelic language that is only privileged to those who are part of a kingdom. And because the enemy is no longer part of the kingdom, he cannot understand the language. It's like, I'm Hispanic, but I don't know Spanish. So when folks speak Spanish, I'm like, I don't understand. And so they say, eh, right? And I'm like, I don't even know what you're saying. But if you start saying some other words, I might know it, right? But at the end of the day, why, why does Paul say, I pray in the spirit more than you all? Why? It's because he goes, at the end of the day, I'm going to pray in a, in a language that the enemy cannot understand. So therefore, he cannot plan to scheme against it. That's a whole nother message, okay? And he says this, and pray in the Spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers. And Jesus said this at one time, and I taught in this on our pray series, that there's all kinds of prayers. And he says, and request with this mind, be alert and always be, keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Yes, an ambassador is not an elected official. An ambassador is chosen by the king. So you're never elected by people. So why please them? You've been hand chosen by the king. And if you are hand chosen by the king and you're an ambassador, it is the responsibility of the king to take care of his ambassador because you are the representative of the king. Hello. And you worried about where your money coming from. For which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may what? Declare it what? Fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. Father, we pray for the spirit of revelation. Give our minds illumination that we'd experience transformation. God, I pray. You give us a mind to perceive, a heart to receive all that you have. And I ask that after this message, we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. amen. You may be seated. If I have a message outline, our ushers will be more than happy to get you one. One of the reasons why I absolutely love Paul, the apostle, was for the simple reason is that Paul, being that astute, in, uh, in the scriptures, and Paul was different than many others. He was a, what you would call a Pharisee to Pharisees. He was like a teacher to teachers. And back before he was converted, Paul uh, was a leader in, Ju in Judaism and in the law of Moses. And so a lot of times when the scholars would want to come and initiate an interpretation of the Torah, which was the first five books of the Bible, they would have to come to a man like Paul to get it approved. And so when, when Paul gets um, captured by God and falls off a donkey and, and gets converted, people are amazed. And yet in those days, Paul not only was this person that was very astute in biblical theology, but he was also a tent maker. And so Paul oftentimes, when he would go out and, and start churches or, or preach the gospel, he usually went to cities that were like cities of commerce or cities of trade. So when you think of Ephesus, Ephesus was a place of trade. It was a place where the marketplace uh, was very high. It would be considered almost like New York City. A lot, of, uh, a lot of trade was going on there. And so these epistles that he wrote was to churches, churches like Philippi, churches like Ephesus, churches like Colossae, churches like Thessalonica. And unlike the other apostles who went to more rural communities, Paul liked to be in Rome. Paul liked to be in big cities. He, he loved going to cities of commerce. And the reason why he would go is because he was a tent maker. And him being a tent maker, he would have to go and sell tents. And if he wasn't selling tents or trading 
for tents, then he would go to these cities, which were the marketplaces, and he would have to buy the materials in order to build the tents. And so the reason why I love Paul a lot, and I somewhat relate to him, some of you that are in business would, is that on one end in the morning, he was a businessman. At night, he became a preacher of the gospel. Paul was a business owner himself having to take care of his own ministry. And so often in his writings, he is using a lot of metaphors. And so like in Philippians, when he talks about you're going to run the race and you're going to press towards the prize that is ahead of you. Well, he's writing it to a church where there's commerce. And usually where there was commerce... What they would do as activities is that they would gamble or, or they, would, they, would, they would have fun when it came to the games, like, like track and, and, and the Romans, the, the lions, fighting the lions. And so, so he understood how to reach his audience. He, he knew how to get to them in a language that they would understand, in metaphors they would understand. This is what made him so brilliant being a leader. So as he is writing about something that could be so complex, like spiritual warfare or spiritual battles. He takes something so complex and he simplifies it to an audience by using the metaphor of a Roman soldier. Because everybody knows in those days what a Roman soldier was. You and I would know what an army is and the Marines. And and so if somebody came up here and used something so complex, but yet they simplified warfare through the lens of a Marine or an army, an army person or or, or the Navy, you and I would understand that. It's our language. It's it's what we, we were brought up in the history of understanding that. And this is what made Paul so brilliant in his communication because on one hand, He was very astute in scripture, but on the other, he was very astute in commerce and in business. And one of the things that I I, I would, when people ask me, what would you describe, Pastor Obed, what would you describe yourself? I I describe myself as a pastorpreneur. Somebody who's a pastor, but I also have businesses. And so at the end of the day, I have multiple streams of what I do. Because at the end of the day, I believe that it is important that you have some sense of ownership of the direction you want your life to go. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Don't get quiet, okay? And so when God called Lisette and I to to the desert, and he says, hey, I want you to go to the east side of the desert, the the people that, that we would get our data from, in church growth, they said, man, that's a graveyard. Don't, man, churches don't, man, and, and, and when we first came to India, I remember driving around India, and I was like, man, there's churches on every corner. But they were all small. And I thought and I realized you have a lot of hardworking people that work with their hands, but they need to learn how to work with their heads. And so when God called us here, he was very clear to me. He says, I want you to not only raise their spirit, But I want you to teach them how to raise their level of thinking. Because the only difference between somebody that was raised in the hood and somebody that's raised in the heel is the mindset. And so you're not poor by what's in your wallet. You're poor in your thinking. Come on, can I go there today? And and so at the end of the day, you took on and you started and you created a belief system that because things were told to you, we're never going to make it. We can never have that. We will never live there. And at the end of the day, those words attached to your thinking and what it did is not even knowing it was marginalizing who you were. And so you would be aspired to have big things in life until you almost stepped into your reality. And yet what you have to understand is that God wants to raise those limits off of you. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the book of John that he gives his spirit without limits. So there should be no limitation that you should have if you're walking according to the spirit. None of us, in some sense, should be victims of our past. Those are lessons that we learned. That's not what defines us. Now that I have an inheritance from God, he's given me what is necessary in order for me to get to where my life should be. And so when Paul 
is writing to the church at Ephesus, he is giving them a principle on what it's like to take territory. Now, Paul is writing from an Old Testament understanding. And in the Old Testament understanding, for instance, like the book of Joshua, everything was about taking territory. So when you think about the children of Israel walking around the Jericho for, for seven, seven, seven days, and, and they're walking around, and they're going around, and there's big walls there, God wasn't interested in them just seeing the miracle of the wall coming down. He was interested in also them getting the spoils that were on the other side. And so the wealth that belonged to them at that time was in someone else's possession. Oh, you're going to make me teach, right? So, so the children of Israel are walking every day for seven days. And they're Moses, I mean, uh, Joshua, why do we have to do this? Joshua, we have to do it. And he says, okay, the walls are going to come down. They didn't have anything. They had just come out of the, they just come out of the wilderness. They didn't have nothing. And all of a sudden, on the seventh day, you know the story, they, they shouted, the walls came down, and a lot of us always parked there. Oh, well, they shouted, and the walls came down, and we don't finish the story. And the Bible says that they went and took the spoils, the gold and the silver that was in the possession of those people that that was assigned to their life. Can I, you want me to simplify it? That somebody had their wealth. And so they took it and then they used it and then they went on and fought other battles. And then they would fight battles and they would take the spoils of that land. Why? Because the Bible says the wealth of the wicked is laid up in the hands of the just. Come on, am I talking to somebody? And so you're not fighting just for, just to fight. You're fighting to take back the wealth that the devil has stolen from you. You're fighting for the joy that the devil has stolen from you. You're fighting the peace that the devil has stolen from you. See, at, at the end of the day, you should never walk out of a battle just with the hallelujah that I, I won the battle. You ought to walk out with the spoils that, oh, you better help me, that God has for your life. And so... All this time while you were in the world, the devil was just stealing you, stealing all your riches. Think about how costly it was to sin. You're not in debt because you're saved. You're in debt because you sinned. So you went and spent money on alcohol, partying, going places. You was putting that thing on your credit card. You was having all this fun, but it led to emptiness. Come on, the devil knows how to get people in debt. Come on, sin will lead you to debt. Only righteousness leads you to abundance. Oh, I know it's quiet. Well, I'm going I'm to I'm a, I'm a preach right now. And so what happens is, is that everything about warfare has less to do with your adversary. He's already a defeated foe. This is why Paul says, I fight the good fight of faith. A good fight is only a good fight if you know you're going to win. So he says, even before I even begin to fight, I'm already fighting a good fight because victory has already been promised to me. So the battle is never about, are we going to win? The battle is, when are we going to win? And then when we win, what are the spoils I'm going to take back? And so right now, Someone has your spoils. There was a time that somebody held your peace. You got mad. They got all, you got all upset. You lost your mind. They held your peace. Some of you in here, some of you watching, someone's holding your joy. And you got to know how to fight to take it back. And so this whole battle that he's talking about takes for you to not put it on, pray it on. I wake up in the morning and my clothes, I have to put them on. 
but my essentials that are needed for me to take back what the enemy has stolen from me doesn't come on about how I put it on. I got to pray it on. And so Reneo says this. Look what he says. He says this about spiritual races. Our battle is against the triple alliance, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The enemy around us, the enemy within us, and the enemy above us. So you are fighting to get things back that were taken from you. This is why you ought to be mad every day when you get up. You have a righteous anger. I don't know, no, you ain't going to steal my joy. Not today, devil. You ain't going to steal my peace. Not today. So, so, so Paul takes you through an order on how and what do I put on in order for me to be victorious in these battles I know I'm going to fight. The first thing he does is he wants you to focus on the truth of Jesus. Notice the first element he talks about when it comes to the armor of God. The Bible says this in the book of Ephesians, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, they would understand that back in their days, speaking of a Roman soldier. Because a Roman soldier would put on a garment. And when he would put on a garment, just like any athlete, you guys would, would know this, is that if it's, if it's like a robe and it's, it, 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 you know, it's over, it's flared out, you can't fight like that. So how do you get the robe to fit you better? You got to get a belt. Some of you get up in the morning, you put a robe on, right? And, and the robe is big and then you, you, you tie it and you tighten it up, right? And it makes it, now it fits you well. You're like, man, this thing's snugging me right now, right? And so in those days, what they would do is they would walk around as soldiers. They was always alert, and they would, they would have this garment on. But when it was time for battle, they would grab their essentials, and all the essentials that they would use in battle had to be connected to the belt. And so the belt was the most important element that a soldier had in that day. It wasn't his shield. It wasn't his sword, it was his belt, because the belt held together the very garment that identified that what he was. And so notice what he identifies the belt to. He says the belt is the belt of what? It's about truth. And so the adversary knows he can't kill you. He knows he can't touch you, so how he defeats you is he distracts you. But how does he distract you? By what? By lies. The Bible says he's the father of lies, and in him there's no truth. So every time the devil talks, he's lying. You ain't going to make it, liar. Your marriage ain't going to work, liar. It is impossible for the devil to tell the truth. He can't tell the truth. He's the father of lies, and in him, there's no what? There's no truth. So every time he talks to you, every time he tries to bring fear on you, it's a lie. The goal of the enemy is to get you to believe a lie. And when you believe a lie... What you are essentially doing is you're taking off your belt. So you got no truth to fight with. And the truth is God's word. Because everything God says is what? Come on, it's the what? It's the truth. If God says you're blessed, you're blessed. If God says you're favored, you're favored. If God says keep your head up and keep on going, you're going to make it. How many know it don't matter? You're going to make it. It may not always be how. Uh, and it, may, you may not be, it may not always seem like how you get there, but you're going to get there. You remember Paul? Paul was on the boat. He was arrested by the Romans. Romans and, and God says, I'm sending you to Rome. He says, all right, God, he gets on the boat. They get caught in a storm. How many know the boat gets shipwrecked? And that last chapter in verse 28, you know how it ends? It says, and Paul got ashore on pieces. 
Sometimes you start in a boat. But you go through some storms and you're going to end up getting there on pieces. The reality is it's not how you get there. It's that you are going to get there because God sent you. Oh, boy, you better help me. It's a Wednesday night. And so when God gives you a truth and you're tested with it, the goal is not to take the belt off. The goal is to tighten it up. And so when, when something comes against me, and it's like the church is going to do it, and, it ain't gonna, and I'm like, oh, no, no, devil. <laughs> no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. The gates of hell shall not prevail again. What am I doing? I'm not, I'm not taking my belt off. I'm tighten it up. Some of you got to just sit there and wake up tomorrow morning and say, devil, you're lying. I'm going to... Tighten the truth up right now. I mean, if you, everything God says is, is the truth. If you call upon my name, you'll be saved. That's the truth. When he tells you, give, and some of you are like, eh. I don't know. It's the truth. It's the truth. But you've been taught, I got to work more to get more. That's not kingdom. Kingdom is I give more to get more. That's kingdom. You've been taught, like I was, you got to Make more to give more. Kingdom says you give more, then you make more. And so some of you are saved, sanctified, filled with God, but your wallet isn't. Because you trust them with your heart, but you don't trust them with your resources. Oh, one day when I get there, you ain't going to get there. My, my, you know, I, I went, when we moved to the desert, you know, people didn't know I owned my own printing company. Sold it for a lot of money. I've had multiple businesses. Always had. My money doesn't come from the church. Let me say that one more time, those of you watching online. And on Facebook. My money don't come from the church. There are, and my wife, there are pastors that have a church of 300 make more than me. Because I never looked at the church as my provider. I became, a, I was a businessman before I was a pastor. And I would die as a businessman. And a pastor. But I'll never forget when my life changed. I was working at Sioux Plantation, 16 years old, got my first check. I was going to the Foot Locker, go buy me some shoes. Come on, shoes are biblical. <laughs> Isaiah 52, 7, how lovely are the feet of them who bring good news. I'm going to show you it's part of the armor of God. I was going to buy me some shoes. My mother took me to the bank, cashed a check. I get in the car, she goes, give me the tithe. I said, Mama, I, I'm going to the Foot Locker. You need to take me to the Foot Locker. It's across the street. And she goes, give me the tithe. I'm going to go to the Foot Locker. Give me the tithe. And you ain't going to argue with your mom. She's so holy. And I said, and I was mad. Here, 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 here. Give it to the church. You can have it, okay? I couldn't get my shoes. I was mad. Went home, pouted. Next day, come home. From school, when I get in my room, there's a box there. I ran back. I said, Mom, who brought these Nikes? These are the ones I wanted to buy. She goes, well, one of your friends came by and dropped them off. God put it on his heart to buy the shoes. 
I was going to use my tithe and rob God from and wear some stolen shoes from God. I, I could be here for months, months, and tell you miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles after miracles. I, I, I'll go shopping with people. Jeff, no, all, all my staff, no, I'll go. I'll go just pick out what you want. I don't have it, but I give it. It's better to give than it is to receive. Because when God tells you the only time test me in this, oh, you better believe I'm going to test you in this. And my wife and I have been supernaturally blessed. It would blow your mind the blessing of the Lord we walk in, the favor of God we walk in. Cars I don't even pay for. Still ask, do you need anything, Pastor? Do you guys need anything? Do you want to help? Anything you need? Do you need anything? But in the day, it's because I tightened. You don't think there were times when we were like, it's the tithe or the rent. And God says, trust me. We would tighten it. We would tighten it. We'd tighten it. And doors would open up. Supernatural things would take place. I was sitting down one day in church. Nobody even knew what was going on. We had to have $27,000. Guy walks up to me right after service and says, Lord, put it in my heart to give you a check. I don't know if church needs it. $27,000 on a Wednesday night. How could God do that? I love how God gossips to people. <laughs> but you know what he does? It's because... There's going to be moments you have to tighten the belt of truth. You get a negative report, sick in body. Uh-uh. I'm the God that healed thee. No, no. I'm going to tighten the truth up every day. I'm going to tighten it up because I'm not going to let a lie enter into my life. My, your relationship, oh, man, my relationship, man. What God has put together, let no man separate. My kids, oh, they just tripping right now. No, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Those are truths. What do you do? You tighten that truth up. And that lie comes, that kid comes in, and, and, and they cuss in and stuff like that. And you're like, Lord, I've been praying for my son. You don't believe that. No, he's marked with God. He's marked with a destiny. And you know what? You go back in the room, instead of yelling back in, go back in the room, yell at the devil. Tighten that truth up. Devil, you ain't taking my son. Devil, you ain't taking my child. I'm tightening that truth up. I'm tightening it up right now. I'm a t you got to tighten that truth up. Why? Because you're not warring against flesh and blood. Principalities, rulers of dark places. Everything begins with truth. The second one, look at number two really quick. Keep short accounts. Well, what does that mean, keep short accounts? With the breastplate of righteousness in place. So you, you, you put on the belt of truth. I'm declaring the truth. The word of God is true. The devil is the father of lies. Now I got to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now it sounds like when you read this, it's like, oh, man, it was this metal plate. It wasn't a metal plate. It was one of very hard leather. They would actually wrap it around them so that then they can have their shield. So they would have this breastplate around them. and They'd never go out to battle without that one element. They had to have it on. It was a very thick leather. And it was very intentional of where it covered. It covered the heart. It covered the lungs. And it covered the organs. I want you to hear me. When you put on the belt of truth. That means truth doesn't hurt you. Lies do. And so when he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness, you know what he's saying? Guard your, guard your heart. It's no good to go into battle with a wounded heart. Come on. At the end of the day, you may have some nicks. You may feel hurt. But don't go in there bitter. Yeah. Don't go in there, you know, I can't stand them. No, no. Those were lies. 
at the end of the day, you ain't good enough to convince me it's you. It's a spirit that's on your life that's manipulating all of this. There is something in you that's godly, and your life is being driven by lies right now. Truth doesn't hurt. Lies do. Liars are just people that God has raised up to be truthful, but they're just acting out of bitterness. Hurt people hurt people. And so the goal is, is listen, who does not go to battle and think they're not going to get hit? Every day. You're going to go out to battle. You're going to get hit. But hit doesn't mean get hurt. That's why keep short accounts. If they come, listen, people talk about you, say things about you, say things at you. That ain't who you are. Why do you let it bother you? Well, I just can't believe they'd say something like that. Well, say that again. I just can't believe they would say something like that. Say it again. I can't believe they would say something like that. Well, it's obviously good that you can't believe they would say something like that because you yourself would probably never say that. It's like, I, I, it's, it's like I, I tell people all the time, I just don't under, you know, people come, I just don't understand them. That's very good that you don't understand them because you don't want to understand their dysfunction. So it's a good thing. I, I just don't understand them. It would be very sad if you did. Because then it would expose that you're just as a manipulator as they are. So the fact that you can't understand them, God is revealing how much you have grown and how far you are from the lies that they're talking about. You know, in, this pre in the preacher's world, man, the, you know, they're teaching, you know, the preachers need to understand how the world is so that they can reach them. I'm like, the devil is a liar. Because why would I want to understand? At the end of the day, when truth always overcomes that, and whatever you understand, you'll become. So you want to make sure, at the end of the day, man, what the enemy's really doing is just revealing how distant you are from that lie that these people are operating in. When you sit there and say, I just don't understand how they would turn their back on me. You want to know why you would say something like that? Because you yourself would never do that. So because you can't find no commonality in that, you don't understand it. When someone talks about you or says something negative about you, and you're like, I just can't believe I helped them. And the next thing you know, they're saying negative things about me. You want to know why you say, I can't understand them. It's because at the end of the day, you yourself will never do that. So let me help you out here. Stop trying to understand them. And just start praying for them. God, I don't, I, I don't understand them. I don't understand why they're saying those things. But I'm not going to let my heart get bitter over this. Because nobody's worth my heart getting bitter. I just want to get better. When every day I'm trying to get bitter, no one's, everyone else is trying to get me to get bitter. I'm not getting bitter. I'm just trying to get better. And so, God, let, that's their dysfunction. You're going to deal with them. You got to deal with their attitude. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just going to smile the next time I look at them. God, you know what? Would you give me a love for my enemies? Isn't it amazing that Jesus taught that? Love your enemies. God, would you give me a love? Would you just, God, would you really give me a love for my enemies? Because, because at the end of the day, I don't have time to be bitter. Yeah. Homie, don't play that. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. It was a, get actively involved. Get actively involved. Look what it says. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Now, I want, I, I want to park here for a moment, and then we'll zoom through the rest. And I, I, I'll I maybe teach this next Wednesday. Look at this. And with your feet fitted with readiness. Every day, God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. I'm going to say that one more time. Every day, God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. So in those days, they would, the, one of the things that they would put on towards the end would be their shoes. 
Because once they were done putting on their shoes, they are ready to go to the prepared place for battle. They never left without their shoes to the prepared place until they were ready. So they would put on their shoes and then they would head towards the prepared place. So for instance, those of you that are military, you, you, you would train, 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 San Diego, all those kind of things, train, train, train. And then we're going to send you to Iraq. They just don't say, hey, guys, we're sending you to Iraq. No, they're like, no, you got to prepare. And so what did you do in preparation? You did everything that possibly could happen, come on, somebody, when you were in the battlefield, right? And then what would, they, what would be one of the last things they do? They'd give you your uniform, and then guess what? You get on that plane, and when you get on that plane and you're getting ready to land in Iraq, you start tightening them shoes up. Why are you tying those shoes up? Because now you're about to enter into a prepared place. But you're not going into that prepared place without having any preparation. So notice what he says. He says, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of what? Anytime you're prepared for something, when you move into it, you have peace. It's the unexpected things that you're not prepared for that brings chaos to your life. And so every day, if your steps are ordered of the Lord, those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. He's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Come on, come on. I mean, you know, man, God, wherever my feet shall tread upon shall be mine. No, no, God's leading me into all truth. The Bible says, what, what, is, what is he saying? He's saying, oh, bet I've prepared you already. Where you're about to arrive is something I have been preparing you all this time for. And so the fact that you're there, well, don't worry about it because guess what? You're so prepared for what's about to happen, you ought to walk in there with some peace in Jesus' name. So when God is bringing you new realms of business, new realms of life, he's prepared you for that. And then when you get there, you're like, oh, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? What do you mean what we're going to do? You've been prepared for it. You ought to have peace. The shoes wouldn't be put on if you didn't have peace. Everywhere God, everything God's doing in your life right now, he's preparing you for what's next. So you should never be afraid of where you're going unless it's on your own. So he's taking you into a prepared place. Therefore, there's peace. And the fact that God is taking you Into a prepared place where there's feet, peace, there's always harvest. God doesn't lead you into famine. He just allows you to pass through it. And the reason why he allows you to pass through famine, just like you have to pass through the wilderness in order to get to the mountaintop, is because he wants you to get a compassion so once you get there, you know how to come back down, come on, and help people that are there. Hello, somebody, right? The next one. Listen, next one, here it is. Trust God in difficult times. Trust God in difficult times. Here it is. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, I'm going to park here, then I'm going to end. We can, we can end, okay? And here it is. Watch this. At, at the end of the day, the breastplate covers your heart. The shield of faith is what they would use to walk towards the arrows. You don't do this with the shield of faith, with the shield. You advance towards where the arrows are coming. When you know that those arrows can't kill you, you don't run from it. You run towards it. What a lot of us do is that we lose the truth. So when we lose the truth, our hearts get bitter so we don't have righteousness. Then we can't find no shoes because we don't have peace. And the devil's devil's throwing arrows and you running. You go Michael Jackson on everybody, man. You moonwalking. 
backwards. You only have a shield to advance. You don't have a shield to retreat. For we walk by faith. If I am told that I'm going to get something, if I'm walking towards it, I believe it. So without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so God is taking you through a battle. But you got faith. Oh, hallelujah. You have faith. The arrows don't kill you. How will you ever know that those arrows can't touch you if you never walked through it? What is faith? It's persuasion. I've been persuaded that if God said it, he'll do it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things like what? So faith, persuasion, turns to substance that eventually produces evidence. You can't have the evidence without the substance. And you'll never get the substance if you're not persuaded. All faith is is taking what's in the invisible and bringing it out to the visible. That's what faith is. I call those things that be not as though they already are. Thank you, Lord, that I'm, I'm blessed and I cannot be cursed. I thank you, Lord, that I'm taking new territory in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that my boss is going to take likening to me in Jesus' name, that favor belongs to my life, promotion belongs. I call in promotion. I call it in right now. In G I prophesy to my future right now. I thank you. I'll never live another day sad, another day broke. I thank you, Lord, that I'm blessed. I'm favored. I call in my clients from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Father, I thank you that I'm taking grounds that my family couldn't take. I'm breaking curses that try to be upon my life. I'm walking by what? Faith. I'm, I'm moving towards it, not running against it. Come on. Number five. Number five. I, I wish I could teach on this more. Win the battle of the mind. Here it is. Win the battle of the mind. Here it is. Number five. I'm going to get you out. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. You want to know that you think, oh, I'm saved. I'm saved. Therefore, I got my ticket into heaven. Salvation means you've been rescued from all. That means everything the enemy has stolen has to come back to you. I put on the helmet of salvation. You know what that means? It literally means God renew my mind every day. Renew my thinking. Because my mind is inundated with lies. And if I start believing these lies, I'm going to take off the belt. If I take off the truth, I've allowed my heart to get bitter and I don't have no righteousness. If I don't have no righteousness, then guess what? I don't have my shoes on because I got no peace, which means I'm not going to go to battle. I'm just going to stay stuck and get depressed. If I don't have the truth on, then what do I fight with? So therefore, there's no need to put on the shield of faith because I don't have the shield of faith because I'm carrying doubt. I'm carrying doubt because I got bitter because I lost righteousness. I became, I became bitter and I lost my righteousness because you know what? It just all started with me taking off the truth and just believing a lie. Come on, are you getting something? And then you want to know what's tormenting me is my mind. Because guess what? I took off my helmet of salvation. Come on, it's a, it, it lines up. It lines up what he does. And then he says this, number six, soak Soak yourself in the Word of God. What does that mean? How do I soak myself in the Word of God? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word. It's my sword. It's the Word. 
how do I, I soak it up. Okay, now, I'm going to give you a picture. I waited this whole moment to just kind of, I just, I'm almost a Picasso trying to paint a picture. Okay, now I'm about to, here's the picture. You ready for the picture? I wake up and I'm blessed of God. But my surroundings don't look like that. It feels like I'm just going through hostile things. It feels like I'm just going through hell and high water. So God, what do I got to do? I got to believe your word. So I get up in the morning. I don't put it on. I I pray it on. And so I get into prayer because prayer takes me from the realm of the visible into the realm of the invisible. And so I'm going to get into the realm of the invisible because that's where I came from. I was born in the visible, but I, I came out of the invisible because the Bible says I live in this world, but I'm not of this world. Which means I came from the mind of God before I ever got into the womb of my mother. And so I'm going to go back to the place where I originally came from. Now watch this. Now, God, I'm going through stuff, and God says, okay, what do you believe? And he says, I said, Lord, I believe your word. He says, really, Obed, you believe my word? Yeah, I believe your word. You really believe that I could bless you out of this situation? You really believe I could shut the mouth of the lions? You really believe I could tear down that Goliath? Do you really believe that? But, Pat, but, but, but God, I just see these big old mountains in front of me. Do you believe I'm a mountain-moving, yoke-destroying power of God? You believe I'm that kind of God? Watch this. Yes, Lord, I believe. Okay, put on the belt of truth. What do I do? I go find scriptures because the word of God is the truth of God. I don't confess my problems. I confess the word. I'm favored of God. I'm the apple of his eyes. I thank you, Lord, that those who are weary, Father, you will not get weary and well to it. God, I thank you that no weapon formed against me and my family shall prosper. Any tongue that would rise up against me shall be condemned. I thank you that I'm a heritage of the Lord. I thank you that I walk by faith and not by sight. I I thank you that I'm not moved by my feelings, but I'm walking by faith. I thank you, Lord, that I'm the head and not the tail. I'm blessed going in, and I'm blessed coming out. I thank you that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for my possessions today. I thank you that you're my peace. I thank you that you're my joy. I thank you that I got wisdom beyond my years. I got favor like Joseph. I got vision like Nehemiah. I got compassion like Jeremiah. I got a prophetic edge like Elijah. I got leadership like Moses. I got boldness like Joshua. I thank you, God. What am I doing? I'm tightening up my belt. I'm tightening it up. He says, okay, now that you tighten up your belt, now that you tighten up your belt, guess what you got to do? Check your heart. Put on that righteousness because righteousness means right standing with God, which means proximity magnifies purpose and distance creates distortion. So I can't be distant, and the only way I'm distant from God is if I'm carrying bitterness in my heart. So God, forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Those people talked about me, but I love them. Lord, those people threw, those people stabbed my back, but I take it out, and I give you that knife in Jesus' name. I thank you that vengeance is not mine, but vengeance is the Lord's. I thank you, Lord, that you'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I thank you, Lord, that I am healthy. I thank you my heart is whole. I thank you that I'm righteous. I thank you that I'm holy. I thank you, Lord, that I have been fearfully and wonderfully made. I walk in the fear of God, not the fear of man. For the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I thank you, God. Now, watch this. I tighten up the truth. I, my heart's right. He says, Obed, now you ready. Put your shoes on. Because the last thing you do before you go to your, go leave your house, the sign that you are ready to leave one environment and move into another is you got to put your shoes on. You put everything else on. But the last thing you put on before you're about to leave the environment of your house into the territory you're about to take, you got to put your shoes on. And so what is you? You put your shoes on. Once you put your shoes on, now all of a sudden you're leaving his presence, and now you're going into the presence of the enemy. So what he tells you, put on the shield of faith. You got to walk by faith. I got to walk by faith. Yeah, I got to walk by faith. Why? Because arrows are going to come. And so therefore, faith 
is the persuasion of me believing that what God has said in the invisible is going to come out in the visible. I walk by faith. I'm not moved by what goes on around me. I'm not moved by what I see, but I'm moved by what I know. I know that he is for me and not against me. I know that he's a God that will make rivers in the desert. I know he will make roads where there aren't no roads right now. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. Now watch this. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to mess with you. Obed, tighten up the belt. You got truth. Make sure your heart's right. Put your shoes on. Now go take territory. And while the darts are coming at you, while the darts are coming at you, and the battle seems to get intensified, don't believe it. Don't switch your thinking. So put on the helmet of salvation to keep my mind renewed, to keep my mind. The helmet of what? Come on, the helmet of what? Come on, the helmet of what? Why do you think he calls it the helmet of salvation? Because if arrows are being thrown at you and you got the shield of faith, you got to keep in mind that it doesn't matter what you're going through, the lion's den. doesn't matter if you're going to a fiery furnace. I serve the God that's the God of my rescue, the God of my salvation, the God that's not going to keep me there. He's going to deliver me out of it. Now watch this. Oh, I'm going to lead you to Saturday prayer. Thought you was going to get away with it. I'm going to put on the belt of truth because I got to believe his word and I fall for lies. Got to make sure my heart's right, breastplate of righteousness. Then I'm ready, so I put on my shoes, which gives me peace. Now I'm going to go into battle. I got the shield of faith. That's the persuasion. I believe. I'm persuaded that that which you have promised, you are faithful to keep it. And all of a sudden, the devil's going to throw arrows. I cannot change my mind in the midst of battles. So I got to put on the helmet of salvation. And oh, by the way, the only thing that I got that's advancing, because righteousness, the shield is for protection. Uh, uh, the breastplate is for protection. The shield is for protection. The shoes are for protection. The belt is for prote protection. The only thing that you got that's not your protection It's the sword. The only way I kill, the only way I overcome is not by my shield, not by my, not, not, not by my breastplate, not by my shoes, but by what? Sword. The sword of the what? Word. The sword of the spirit, which is the what? It's the word. So I tell the devil, I'm not coming on my word. I'm coming on his. And he said, my son belongs to him. You got to let him go. Uh, he said that my husband belongs to him. You got to let him go. That land belongs to me. You got to let that go. That business belongs to me. You got to let that go. My, that promotion belongs to me. You got to let that go. Why? Because I'm not coming on my word. I'm coming on You're going to make me run up in this place. And you know what he says the last thing? I got, I got the truth. My heart's right. My, got my shoes on. I'm advancing in faith. The battle's going on, but I'm not going to lose focus. I'm not, so I'm going to put on my helmet of salvation. And then I got my sword. And then he says, and when you're doing all of that, don't Stop praying. Can I tell you what that means? Oh, you about to lose your mind. Can I tell you what that means? It means you have no conversation in battle with your enemy. You only have conversation with your general.
I can't talk about my battles. Why? Because I don't conversate with my enemy. I conversate with the one who gave me the truth. I conversate the one who has given me the right heart. I conversate the one that's given me my shoes. I conversate with the one that's given me a shield. I conversate with the one that has given me the sword. And I conversate with the one that's given me my helmet. I conversate with him so that I'm taking back what the enemy has stolen from him. And he says, oh, Beth, go right. I go right. He says, oh, Beth, go left. And guess what? You're going to end up at the place God has desired in your life. Can Come on. Let's lift him up right now. In Jesus. Come on. In the darkness. Yes, God. In the darkness.